of the um, New Testament Church and a Christian school. He's a constitutional scholar and a historian and the director of Plymouth Rock Foundation. Dr. Daly. Well, good to be here. I remember uh, coming to Liberty Chalk Court a few years ago. Maybe it was even six or seven, I'm not sure, but um, time flies. But um, uh, it's been uh, a great, uh, I know a lot of the folks that are here. And so what I would like to do here, I'm going to jump through a few um, of these PowerPoint slides. I'll just tell you right away the PowerPoint slides were developed as a Bible study in our church uh, when I teach on the family and teach on the importance of the family. So I might just skip uh, uh, by some of them to get right to the key points that I would like to make here tonight so you can see the significance. I think most of us are aware of the fact that uh, if you're going to do something on the history of the family, uh, and especially if I'm the pastor, is the lightning coming from the storm? <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's a, no, I'm fine. That's fine. I think it's, it's bright enough. But the point is that um, when you're doing those kind of things, it's sometimes a shock. I teach history, and I often teach in front of audiences that are not familiar with the Bible, And but as a pastor, uh, where do I begin? I always begin at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, where did we get the family? Whose idea was the family in the first place? The family was not invented by society. The family was not invented by some person who stayed up late at night and said, hey, this would be a nice thing. The fact that uh, if you're going to do something on the history of the family, uh, and especially if I'm the pastor, is the lightning coming from the storm? <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's okay. No, I'm fine. <laughs> I think it's, it's bright enough. But the point is that um, when you're doing those kind of things, it's sometimes a shock. I teach history. I often teach in front of audiences that are not familiar with the Bible. And But as a pastor, uh, where do I begin? I always begin at the beginning. And um, where did we get the family? Whose idea was the family in the first place? The family was not invented by society. The family was not invented by some person who stayed up late at night and said, hey, this would be a nice thing. Uh, there would be no family if it weren't for God. God is the one who organized the family. He's the one who said God was going to create man in his image. And that Hebrew word for man is men and women. It's mankind. Uh, in the image of God created he him, that male and female created he them. When we go back to the beginning, we get the blueprint. We get the idea, the ideal of what the family is like. And the family is supposed to be like. That became the standard. In fact, this was the standard throughout many civilizations. And this was the standard. Just about everything I'm going to share with you, even from a biblical concept, uh, is a worldview that the framers of our Constitution believed. Uh, they were very uh, conscious of this fact. They were not all evangelical Christians. They were not all individuals who might revere the Bible the way I do. But they were individuals who bought into this kind of worldview. So there was a beginning here. Not only that, uh, if we look at it, these are two key, key concepts that came from the creation account. Uh, whether you talk about John Locke or you talk about William Blackstone, who was the jurist who, who brought forth the theory of law in America, they all went back to creation. They all went back to creation as the standard. This is where we start. Then sin came in, and then we had a fall. But their ideal is, let's through Christ, through the Redeemer, let's get back to as much of the original uh, standard we can. Now here's some key points. That we are to bear God's image in the earth and individuals, and remember all rights and responsibility in creation came to individuals. God never gave rights to groups. That's huge. It's yes. massive. Yeah. Because here's the key thing. John Locke reasoned it this way. If God first created the state, then, as he would say, and I'm summarizing in his two treatises on civil government, he said, well, if God first created the state, then it would be understandable why the king feels he's the source of even the womb. Now, he's saying this in danger of his life. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, listen, but God didn't. God created individuals first. And then he created the family. And then only later did he create civil government to protect the rights he already gave to individuals and families. Do you see, by going back to the beginning, there was this reasoning process to say what came first? Who came first? And when you recognize that God created individual, Adam, first, then he created Eve, and then marriage, and then the family, and then the antitype of the church, after Noah and the priesthood and his sacrifice, 
And then civil government in Genesis 9. I just walked you through Genesis 1 to 9 in a very <laughs> particular way. That ideology, though, you have to recognize. We might say, well, gee, not everybody is religious as somebody else. They don't all look to the Bible. But you need to realize that when the founders framed America, this is what they thoroughly believed, that God gave rights to individuals and not to groups. And this is huge because the moment you give a right to a group, it is not a right any longer. It's a privilege. Yeah. And therefore... This was a critical idea. Now, also, God created the home. And, of course, in this verse, man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, they shall be one flesh. There are three key Hebrew words here and verbs. And they identify key parts of the home, the importance of the home. Why would you leave one home and go start another? Because the home is very important. The home is significant. What's the nature of cleaving in the home? <coughs> What's, what is the mission of the home? You know, when we take a look at this, we find out, we could take a look at each of these, and I, if I'm teaching a Bible study, I stop, I really go through this in some detail, but I'm just laying a foundation, and then I want to show you how a key founders, key individuals in history taught on the family as a fabric of American society. First of all, think about this, and this was taught very often in American culture. Um, the home is the first governing institution. You first learn about government in the home, good or bad. It qualifies us for wider spheres of influence. The Bible makes it very clear. If you don't make it work in the home, you know what? You're probably not going to make it work in any other sphere. So I remember the time when I had a, uh, a politician in my constitutional law class come in, running for office, he was a candidate, and I had some sharp 8th and ninth grade students. And this candidate made the blunder of all blunders by coming in and beginning to talk about the origin of rights. And he was just all over the place. And in fact, uh, the, one of the eighth graders just raised a hand and said, uh, Sir, can I ask you a question? Oh, why certainly, why certainly. I want to know if you're personally in debt. <laughs> I, I, he said, I'm offended. How could you possibly ask that to them? What would that have to do with anything? And then she quoted this. She said, because the way you live your personal life will be the way you live your public life. Right. Now, she was right, and once she saw that he was backing up, you know, sometimes you have to really and teach on humility and everything else, <laughs> because he was not prepared for that kind of a question, but it's a biblical idea. That's right. The biblical idea is, and it's written into the state constitution of Massachusetts, by the way, and it actually exhorts citizens to find out how individuals conduct themselves for frugality, prudence, and all the rest. It's a place to practice piety and stewardship. That's where the home first came. The Great Reformation in England was called the Revival of Hearth and Home. Think about that. Why? The hearth was the fireplace. Why was that important? That's where the family gathered. That's where the father began to read the Geneva Bible to his children for the first time. Bible small enough to carry, cheap enough to own, divided into Bibles, verses so he could study, first commentary. He would read that to his children. It was the revival of hearth and home that spread across the culture and society and that birthed the pilgrims coming in and the Puritans and the colonial. It's the first church, the first place where you worship. I often say to families, if you don't sing at home as a family, I can understand why you don't sing in church. What happens in the home? The home is the seminal seed for what happens here. And it's the first state. It's the first government and economy. Think about it. What a parent tell, teaches a child on how to govern in their own economics is going to have a tremendous view. And if it's neglected, if it's ignored, if you wait for someone else to do it, there's a problem. And so the home is this seminal institution. Think about the nature of the home. It's a place of united intimacy. It's a place where we learn to cleave to God and to one another. We learn how to work out differences. I remember my wife and I, when our children were little, uh, I had learned over the years, and I would tell when they were arguing, uh, our son and our daughter got into an argument, and I'd say, okay, there are, their voices are never raised in anger one to another in this home. It's not allowed. It, it, it's outlawed. Mom and dad are the legislative <laughs> branch. Of the home. We have come together, and we have ratified this. We are also the Supreme Court. <laughs> and we are the ones that are going to tell you, and this is not happening, so why don't you go in the room, I'm going to give you five minutes. You work it out, you forgive one another, and you come out and tell us how you did it, because they have to learn how to resolve differences. 
It's, it's a place of generational continuity. It's a place to, to tell your child when they're eight or nine, I'm praying for your spouse. I'm praying for our grandchildren. I'm praying for four generations beyond. Because where you live right now is not it. It's not all about you. Nothing just gravitates around you. You put down your selfish desires because what decisions you make today are going to affect four, five, six generations from now. You, and today, we have in a culture nobody thinks past lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and so the idea is to get people to think generationally is amazing. We just think of the, the latest thing that's attacking our liberties. We must realize the way we fight that, the attitude we embrace of loving those who do not agree with us and all the rest are going to go farther than the legislation we try to have enacted. Because it's, it's huge. So you recognize there's a mission in the home, too. It's the first place of evangelism. First place of discipleship. It's the first nation. Now, I'm not making these up. I'm using phrases used by those who framed the United States and, and who are founders, pilgrims, Puritans, colonial preachers, and our founders. Think about this. This was the worldview of the founding, that God gave rights to individuals and that those rights were initially to be practiced where? In the home. The foundation of the home was marriage. The fruit of marriage was child training. And the discipline, the ultimate... Uh, discipline was corporal punishment, done under, uh, not in anger, not out, out of any abuse, but there was a, a place of discipline. And then there you had the church. The foundation were the members, the fruit were the disciples, the discipline was excommunication. It was the ultimate discipline of the home. This was the worldview that was taught at the time of our founding. And the state, the foundation was law, the fruit of it was justice, the purpose of civil government is to keep justice. The purpose of civil government has grown so massive today that it's everything in cradle to grave. But this is not the way the founders thought. They thought in three very distinct jurisdictions founded by a major jurisdiction being the individual. And therefore, uh, you have the, the ultimate discipline in the state, capital punishment. The state deals with voluntary association of nations, the home voluntary association of families to produce businesses. See, in the framing of the founders, the founders believed that all businesses were extension of families. <coughs> and that's why if you go to Williamsburg, one of my favorite places to give tours, if you go to Williamsburg, you find out the original homes when they unearthed it and recreated that village, every home had a, a building right next to it, which was its business. So here's your home, you walk next door and you do your shoes. You deal with your blacksmith. And they're all related to families. So when we think of that, we think of marriage now as the foundation of the home. This is the key. I, I often say this to couples with my wife and I are counseling. If you can't make it work between husband and wife, don't think that you're going to make it work with your children. Oh, well, we just hide all the problems we have uh, with each other. The children won't notice. Oh, man, they see 10 times more than you wish they didn't see. And we know that. And we know what's happened in our society ever since. You think of the children. It was a taught that the nature of children, they have a tremendous potential, but they have a nature that is, is bound, corrupt because of sin. They're going to do the things that are wrong. You don't have to teach a child to say no. Uh, they, they even, you don't have to say, well, when you say no, would you have an attitude, please? Mm -hmm. Would you say it like, no? No, that comes naturally. You don't have to teach that. Uh, what you have to teach is, yes, mom. Yes, dad, with the right attitude. Internal, external. I did chapel today in our Christian school, and I, my chapel was on internal honor, external obedience. And sometimes you have to act it out. And you just, you do it. We, we used to do with our children the attitude game. You know, do what mommy says. She's going to tell you right now. She's going to tell you something to do. Do what mommy says, but with a bad attitude. We were shocked that they knew what a bad attitude was. <laughs> <laughs> Expressions at all. But the idea of child training, the idea of child training, the idea of training children to be good citizens, training children to be good uh, in individuals with character, that character is number one, has long since vanished in our culture. And yet that was the whole point of it. So think of this a quote by Reverend S. Phillips of 1860 in his book, classic book, uh, the Christian home. He published it in 1860 because he said, I fear that America is losing its heritage of Christian homes. Mm. Wow. I wonder what he would write today. <laughs> Example is teaching by action. Such is its influence that you can estimate the parent by the child. Ooh, ouch. Show me a child, polite, courteous, refined, moral, honorable, and all his sentiments and conduct, and I will point you to a well-conducted nursery to noble and high-minded parents, faithful to their offspring, 
Thus, the child is a living commentary upon its home and its parents. The child is the moral reproduction of the parent. Think this was the concept in early America. This was the concept of how it works. Think of home as government now, as we said. Home is a little commonwealth, jointly governed by the parents. It involves all. The mutual relation of parents and child implies authority on the one hand, obedience on the other. Home is the first form of society. It is similar in its fundamentals to the government of the state and church. It involves the legislative, judicial, executive functions. Its elements are law, authority, obedience, and penalties. The basis of its laws is the word of God. This, this is, he's not making this up. He's teaching it from the scriptures, this, this uh, classic a book. It's out of print. I do have a original copy in my library. But it's out of print, but I tell you, it's phenomenal because you know why? It tells you what was being taught. You know what I mean? What was being taught at that time period and would it appear a bit radical today. So the American home, for 300 years, from about 1620 to 1920, it was the heart of church and state. And from a historic standpoint, as an historian in America, we recognize that this, that what I've just shared with you in a crash course from Genesis you know, to Ephesians, uh, is, was the foundation, was the basis. And then it began to be lived out. Now listen, no home is perfect. No child is the perfect reproduction of the parent. Children will do strange things that parents never taught. We all know that. And they will do all kinds of things. But you, as a general rule, you recognize this is true. Now this is what the average home in America. The Bible was the main text. Lawrence Kremen, who was a Harvard man in the 1800s, and he was studying education, and then early 1900s, by the time he published his books, uh, in 1940s, 50s, and 60s, he said this, Lawrence Kremen, he said that all the evidence points to the fact that the Bible was the major text of education in America. Yeah. It was the number one textbook. It was used at home, even when it was not used in the school. Even Horace Mann, who would later you know, repudiate many biblical ideas, Horace Mann said, don't ever let the Bible leave the classroom. That's Horace Mann. I use that quote. Family worship included psalm singing, attentive participation around the hearth, character <laughs> formation to train a child, faithfulness to uphold your family name, attend shirts, and produce self-employed dynasties. You know, when Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in 1830, he witnessed many things. One of the things he witnessed is this. He wrote, he said, I'm amazed. I came to a culture called America, and nobody works for anyone else. Think about that. In other words, everyone was self-employed. Mm. And he said the average family has 10 to 12 children, and they become the employees <laughs> of the family business. And it's a family dynasty that goes from generation to generation. Because amazingly, in America, there are no inheritance taxes. <laughs> At that time. 1830. <laughs> and the people are free to inherit all that the family has built. Can you think of accumulated family dynasties? This that is what was taught. Nice. In the home. Think of this, that this little fountain, when I give tours in Plymouth, this is the Pilgrim Mother Monument in Plymouth. Now the Pilgrim Mother Monument, when it was first constructed in 1920 at the Tercentenary Celebration. Now pick up a brochure at the back, we're dealing with the Quattrocentennial, the 400th anniversary, next year in Plymouth. I only came here if you would agree to all come. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point is this, that here, notice, when they produced this monument, this was the unique aspect of the pilgrims who came as families, unheard of. In 1620, you did not get on a boat with father, mother, and child and say, hey, we're going on vacation. It did not happen. Women and children did not travel. The fact that they came as families showed their dedication. And the amazing thing is, as the inscription says on the bottom, which is right in the back down here, they brought up their families in sturdy virtue and a living faith in God without which nations perish. Think of that quote. Amen. That's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And why? You know why? This monument was the fount was in the form of a fountain. So in the in the, the fountain, because the family is the fountain of society. Mm -hmm. That was the picture of the pilgrims. Think of this: that family rights were extensions of individuals. These were the civil laws were against bigamy, polygamy, fornication, adultery, divorce. Now they knew divorce was going to happen. Now there are some laws even in the South today that are leftovers of some of the original colonial laws, for instance, against divorce, where if someone is going to divorce, they won't let you finalize it for at least a year. Why would a state say you can't finalize a divorce for at least a year? So you reconsider the effects on the children, 
and your life? Is there any way that this marriage can be saved? See, that is a concept that was very much in part of uh, American life. Mm -hmm. Think of this, that um, I was just reading a, a, a research book again on, on the family, and I thought this, one, this phrase was pretty awesome. It said this, it said, whatever laws were against certain sins in the culture, public opinion was the most severe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning that even if someone said, oh, I want to do it, it was so Christian, if you can use that term, at least in the cultural aspect, that public opinion frowned on it so much, you wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that, we live in a different day today. Mm -hmm. But I'm leaving that to mind. Okay, so, <laughs> no, there were coverture laws in context made a woman equal and protected her property. For the coverture laws are laws that come out of the Old Testament that were translated into society to protect a woman and her, and her property. You know, a lot of people, they say, well, gee, America couldn't be Christian because men and women were unequal uh, during that time. But what you don't understand is that um, in every society, women had been persecuted and were not even somewhat considered property. But when Christianity permeates a society, equality begins to come up, even with distinct functions. And you saw that coming in the coverture laws for the protection. You have to direct, realize what direction they're moving in. The family was the foundation for the church and the state. Marriage was both civil and religious. The pilgrims realized it was a sacred union, marriage was, but it was also the cornerstone to society. <coughs> so it was a civil. So right from the very beginning, you can have a justice of the peace, right? To marry. Because it was the cornerstone of society. Now, now think about John Adams when he said, he wrote in 1778, these words. The foundations of national morality must be laid in what? Private family. Private family. In vain are schools, academies, and universities instituted if loose principles and licentious habits are impressed upon children in their earliest years. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that children can have any just sense of the sacred obligations of morality or religion if from their earliest infancy they learn that their mothers live in habitual infidelity to their fathers, and their fathers in a constant infidelity to their mothers. Like, how could it be that children grow up healthy if there's an unhealthy relationship modeled before them? Now, it's interesting because he was writing about women, probably inspired by Abigail Adams. You know that John Adams said, the smartest person in my family is my wife. She has the brains and I have the brawn. But anyway, the point is, James Wilson, another founder who was a very, very uh, influential, said, it is the duty of parents to maintain their children decently according to their circumstances, to protect them according to the dictates of prudence, to educate them according to the suggestions of a judicious and zealous regard for their usefulness, their respectability, and their happiness. Think of Lydia Sigourney, 1851, very well-known woman. For the strength of a nation, especially of a Republican nation, is in the intelligent, well-ordered homes of the people. And in proportion as the discipline of families is relaxed, will the happy organization of communities be affected and national culture and character become vagrant, turbulent, or ripe for revolution. Well, that's powerful. She was a great uh, Now, Joseph's story, I'm going to skip that long quote there, but I want to go here to uh, a recent foundation, a Heritage Foundation conducted in 2013, a massive study on the family. And I like some of the concluding remarks. The founders defended the family as one of the chief educational institutions fostering genuine self-government, emphasizing self-control, instead of the later progressive or Deweyan emphasis on social control. If the founders are correct, now this is his words, I underline them, America's experiment in self-government depends on reviving the strength of marriage and the family today. In other words, if we're going to see a revival here, we cannot see a revival if we just look from the outside in. One of the most dangerous things we can look at is we think if we change laws, we change hearts. We may change laws and put a thumb in the dike, but until we see a massive revival among families and children and among the youth, and we're going to need a revival to reverse this, then you're not going to see it. Fewer marriages, of course, there's now cohabitation is normal. Most bad marriages now end in divorce over 50%. Single parent dysfunctional families, the, that, it's been proven, educational attainment of children suffers, fatherlessness. You guys have a great study on fatherlessness that's mm -hmm. available for people. Uh, so what happens when the family has disintegrated in the last 100 years? Who has stepped in to replace the family? The state. The state. Now, I want you to give you two comments. On this. Number one, every time the state steps in, it's not always because the state is intending to do something wrong. 
when they see something, it becomes a safety net. Mm -hmm. I have a different perspective at times. I understand where the country's at, but I can tell you this, most often, and I can prove it historically, the state has stepped in because the church has done nothing. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And I say to pastors and to individuals, if we don't restore the church reaching out to feed families, the church reaching out in the community to deal with the opioid crisis, the church reaching out there, we are only kidding ourselves if we're going to simply stop the state from doing it, but there's no replacement on the other end. Mm -hmm. We need both. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Now please welcome our next speaker, Mr. Michael King, Director of Community Alliances at Mass Family Institute. All right, just give me a second to get my PowerPoint up here and run it. All right, it's great to be with you tonight. Um, how many of us have heard of Massachusetts Family Institute? Awesome. That is a much higher percentage than I usually get. Um, how many of us have heard of Focus on the Family? Great. So we are the local associate of Focus on the Family uh, here in the Bay State. Uh, of the 50 states, uh, there are 40 states that have a, a family policy alliance. So would you, would you agree that all of our states need a Paul Revere uh, when it comes to uh, what is being considered at our state house uh, regarding laws? And a lot of those laws targeted at the family. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about religious liberty tonight and then uh, talk about where we are in terms of current bills that we can all work together uh, to fight. And if there's one thing that is an action item for you tonight, it's please come to Lobby Day on March 20th. Okay, so that's about 20 days from now. We want to see all of you down at the State House. We would love to have a thousand people, okay? A thousand people down at the State House to stand for life, liberty, marriage, parental rights, um, sex education, we're concerned about the list goes on, right? Uh, so please do consider that. I'll tell you just something real quick. We had a thousand of our Chinese friends show up at the State House last year. They were told that they were the largest group to come to the State House in 70 years. So how many of us know that there is, you know, there are churches in Massachusetts that have more than a thousand people, right? Um, so all, I, all I'm saying is that a lot of times we are intimidated, I think, as a body of believers, that, you know, what difference can we make in Massachusetts? Um, well, I'll tell you, they were the largest group in 70 years. We had 20 doctors come down to the state house uh, regarding physician-assisted suicide, and uh, we defeated that last year, right? That was, that was, and that was 20 doctors. Is that a lot of people? No, right? We had 300 people come down uh, when the bathroom bill was being discussed as law two years ago. We were told that uh, we were the second largest group in that two-year legislative session uh, to come down to the state house. Right? 300 people. How many? How many churches do we do we have in Mass that have more than 300 people? Right. Um, so you know, you think about Gideon's army of 300. Right. You think about uh, David and Goliath of one. Right? That um, the Lord is on our side. If He is for us, who can be against us? And I don't just say that as a cliche, it's true. Right? And uh, so we want to work together with you to strengthen and protect the family in Massachusetts. So I, I brought my wife and my oldest son, Jesse, uh, with me tonight, and I will show you the rest of my family here. You clap for that, right? That's good. So this is why I do what I do. This is why I travel all over the state, speak at churches every Sunday. Uh, last week I was in Worcester at a 450 member Hispanic church uh, that got so, they gave me an hour to preach from the pulpit uh, at each service and they're gonna sponsor a bus to come down to Lobby Day uh, because they're just so on fire. Yeah, yeah, and, and, these, and these, you can clap, that's, that's good stuff, right? Um, I spoke at a thousand member Russian church uh, in Westfield. Do you guys know there's a thousand member Russian church in Massachusetts? A uh, 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 500 member Ukrainian church. Do you guys know there's a 500 member Ukrainian church? In, uh, all right, but, but when you go around the state, in many ways, um, 
this movement that really we get excited about because there, there's so much to be discouraged about, right? Um, but when you go around the state and you see all these churches, many of them immigrant churches, yes. uh, that really quickly understand the threat mm -hmm. um, and are, are very willing to get in line and say, where can I help, mm -hmm. right? Uh, before I get too much of my talk, I'll tell you one quick story. The city of Lawrence, you guys know where Lawrence is? Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, would it surprise you that Lawrence was the first city in Massachusetts to completely ban commercial marijuana? So you cannot open up a pot shop in the city of Lawrence because of the local church, right? Back in July of 2017, 200 Hispanics, all Hispanic. I was the only guy there that was, whatever you want to call me, Anglican, whatever, I don't know how I refer to myself, but um, 200 from, and, the, and would, it, would it surprise you that there's 120 Hispanic churches just in Lawrence, and they make up 5,000 people out of 85,000 people that live in the city, and that 7%, that 7% of Lawrence has made it so that you can't open a pot shop in the city of Lawrence, right? That's amazing, right? I mean, that is the power of the local church, right? I mean, you had pastors getting up at the pulpit, I call it the pulpit, in the city hall, right? And making their case from the New Testament why marijuana is bad for Lawrence. Now, when's the last time you heard a, heard a good marijuana sermon, right? <laughs> Especially at the city hall. Um, and so, just an amazing thing, at 11.30 at night, the city hall took a vote and it was unanimous, eight to nothing, to ban commercial marijuana. Uh, and then also, would it surprise you that, so you guys know question three on November 6th, right, the, the bathroom law repeal. So we lost 68-32, but 850,000 people voted no on question three, right? Um, well. Out, so there's 351 towns and cities in Massachusetts, okay? You know how many towns and cities voted no in the majority? If you said six, you'd be right, okay? So it's not a big number, right? But you know what? There was one city that voted in the majority no on question three, and that was the city of Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, you know, the only city to vote for the support of privacy and safety in public accommodations uh, when we had, you know, grown men walking into young ladies' bathrooms, um, like at the Woburn Target, enticing them with candy, and not not being prosecuted at all because they identified as a woman at the time. So, look, I know there's this is a hugely controversial issue, of course, in our state, but we were concerned about privacy and safety of especially our young girls in public accommodations. But I just want to tell you a story about Lawrence that. If every city in town were like the city of Lawrence, we might actually be Kansas, okay? Uh, so, you know, something to think about. And I always tell people, look, if I were to ask you how many churches, according to the Secretary of State's office, how many churches do you think are in Massachusetts? Someone take a guess, be brave and bold. Take a guess. A thousand? Higher. Five thousand? Like an auctioneer. Uh, higher than 5,000, it's actually 8,000. Would that surprise you? Wow. There's 8,000 churches in Massachusetts. Now, not all of them agree the, the, the way we do. Um, but, in, just to give you a little, little perspective, in Iowa, there's 4,200 churches. Okay? Um, and so, and I was kind of the same, if not a little bigger geographically, than Massachusetts. But just think about that. Massachusetts has almost 8 thousand churches. We indeed are the most organized body of people, even in the bluest of blue states, right? And there's no reason that we need to put up with laws, right, that in many times um, threaten the privacy and safety of our young girls especially. So something to think about, something to be inspired by, uh, and we hope that you will partner with us and come to Lobby Day. So here is our shared mission dedicated to strengthening the family and the Judeo-Christian values upon which the family is based. And I couldn't agree with Dr. Jaley more that strong families create strong states, strong cities, and strong towns. Uh, so here you see that alliance. Uh, we're aligned with many different organizations. You see focus on the family there. Have you guys heard of Alliance Defending Freedom? Okay, so they represented Jack Phillips, the baker in Colorado, who won his case last June uh, after they took 40% of his business, uh, but he did win. 
uh, which is a victory for all of us. Um, and then also we partner with the Family Research Council. Have you guys heard of Tony Perkins, yes. Family Research Council? Okay, so basically they do on a, what we do on a state level, they do on a national level. Okay, so we all care about life, liberty, and marriage. And then you can see there the orange uh, states are states that have a family policy alliance. So MFI would be considered a family policy alliance. You can see the states that do, are not in orange, they do not have an advocate. So in states like Rhode Island, um, in states like New Hampshire, I'll talk about this later tonight, they've passed the counseling ban, okay? Because really, to a, lar to a large extent, they have no advocate that's raising awareness to these dangerous bills that are becoming law. So here's the uh, three main areas that we care about, sanctity of life, and obviously that's been in the news a lot, both at the conception and end of life. How we define marriage, I'll add to that how we define gender, right? And then also religious liberty. So we'll start here. God the Creator, who is the supreme authority over His entire creation, appoints lesser authorities to rule in certain areas. We see this in Romans 13. Government is one example. Paul explains that civil authorities are appointed by God for the support of public order and the common good. At least we, we hope that civil authorities and governments are put in place for the common good. Uh, but we must always, always remember that the rule of civil magistrates over us is not absolute. Only God's moral law binds our consciences. We are to obey God, even if it means disobeying lesser rules in certain situations. You know, we see several examples of this in Scripture. We see Daniel being told not to pray, right? So was it wrong of Daniel to pray when the king told him not to? Was it wrong of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not to bow to the idol when told not to? Was it wrong for the disciples in Acts to continue to preach in the name of Jesus when told not to. There is a higher law that's given by the Lord and um, you know, reason for why we as Christians need to pay attention to that and act accordingly. You guys know this guy, who this guy is? Yeah. So there's Jack, right? Uh, he's, he's a hero, right, uh, in Colorado. And uh, like I said, his story is our story. Right? His victory in June is your victory in June when it comes to religious liberty. And I'm sure you heard the story that once he won his case, he was sued again. Right? I think this time for what? Not baking a, a transgender cake or something of that nature. Uh, so they, the, in, the, the tolerant side is rarely tolerant. Amen. Uh, no on question three, um, so why I bring this up in terms of a religious liberty perspective um, is the churches, when this bill was first passed into law in 2016, churches were considered public accommodations. Did you know this? Okay, so if a man went into your uh, church bath, your church um, woman's room, okay, that you would be discriminating as a church uh, and you could come under penalties of up to $50,000 or serve jail time for up to a year. So we thought that that was a violation of religious liberty. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So four pastors in Massachusetts sued the Attorney General Maura Healy. Okay? Um, and it didn't even go to court because Maura Healy knew she had no case. Right? So we got a letter uh, in December of, when was it, 2016, I believe. Uh, saying churches are no longer public accommodations, okay? So it took four brave pastors, right, uh, to, to just get involved. I mean, they really just had to sign a piece of paper. I mean, look, let's fight our battles where we're just signing papers as opposed to, you know, using other equipment that we'd rather not use, right? Let's do it while we can use our voice, right? And like I said, almost 8,000 churches, there's no reason that we have to put up with some of these laws. <coughs> This is uh, when I told you the 300 people that were outside the House of Representatives when the bathroom bill was being considered a law. This is us. Uh, right outside the House of Representatives, 300, we were told we were the second largest group to come to the State House in that two year legislative session. You, what, don't you think it's a good idea that we bring uh, prayer back to the State House, right? So this, this was us as 300 people gathering for prayer outside the House of Representatives, and this is what we want you to do on Lobby Day. Come with us to Lobby Day. Uh, it starts at Park Street Church in a great historical venue. We'll train you on a lot of stuff that I'll talk about tonight, but additional things as well. 
uh, and then you will have the chance to go to the state house and speak directly face to face with your state representative, your state senator, and say this is why the sex ed mandate should not pass. This is why the counseling ban should not pass. This is why we don't need 30 new bills that are going to make commercial marijuana more accessible to our youth, right? And the list goes on. So please, please consider doing that. And here are the public accommodations uh, under the bathroom law, which unfortunately is still a law in Massachusetts. But you can see these public accommodations, bathrooms, shelters, um, dressing rooms, locker rooms, fitness centers, nursing homes, and churches, of course, are no longer on that list. Uh, but look, would you, be con would you be concerned if you went to the local gym and were taking a shower after working out and a man comes in there, right, and the law allows him to look but just cannot touch? Is that the law you want to live under in Massachusetts, right? And they have a certain clause about you cannot loiter, but how ambiguous is that? I mean, how are you supposed to prosecute loitering? I, I don't necessarily know how we define that, okay? But clearly this is a violation of privacy and in many times safety, right? Um, and that's why we were so concerned about question number three. You guys have heard of Gordon College, right? So uh, many of you probably know the story, right, of uh, Dr. Lindsay who signed this, uh, this uh, letter that got him in trouble. Uh, but here's the conduct policy at Gordon. It says, students and faculty voluntarily pledge to abstain from sexual activity outside of marriage. Now, does that make sense? When it comes to Gordon College, would yes. you expect this yes. from a Christian institution, yeah. right? All right, so here we have July 2014. President Lindsay is one of 14 faith leaders who wrote a letter, how dare he, to President Obama asking for an exemption from a new executive order for religious or faith-based organizations to not discriminate regarding hiring, okay? Mm -hmm. Because uh, they have their own policy. They're a religious organization. They should be able to act accordingly especially when it comes to hiring. So one week later after, past, after President Lindsay signs this letter, the Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll publicly cuts ties with Gordon. And this is the, uh, how the general Massachusetts law uh, says to protect Gordon. It says protection under the Mass General Law promote the religious principles for which it is established or maintained. Is Gordon College established to promote the religious principles of abstinence. Yes, right? So under the law, they should be protected. Well, soon after that, we see Salem ends Gordon College use of town hall. Accreditation Commission gives Gordon College a year to review update policies. Christian College under pressure over gays feeling pushed from students, faculty, and Gordon College was misrepresented under the Boston Globe. So we could, and then in August, the Lynn School Committee stops accepting Gordon student teachers. Um, and there was really no notice for this. The Lynn School had this wonderful relationship with Gordon where their students were going to do these after school programs and the kids were getting a ton out of it, both the, the Gordon College students and the students from the Lynn Schools, and abruptly cut off. Uh, September, New, New England Association of Schools and Colleges asked Gordon to review its policy. And here we have, you know, the First Amendment rights that Gordon, that Gordon has. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, assembly, and petition the government. I mean, this is really what makes America special, right? And these were being violated regarding Gordon. Well, here you have Peter Kersen of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. This is what he said. This, this actually never went to court uh, because they knew that they wouldn't win. They just wanted to intimidate. Uh, but here the... Uh, United States Commission of Civil Rights says discriminating against Gordon College on the basis of its hiring practices is discriminating on the basis of its religious beliefs. The committee is impermissibly discriminating against Dr. Lindsay by punishing Gordon College because he exercised his First Amendment right to free speech. Right, so we're glad the way that it, this ended, but Dr. Lindsay in this whole process, I mean, he even he had two young girls, right? He even had to hire security, personal security, because of the threats that he was under. You know, Lynn lost... Uh, wonderful students from Gordon that were doing a great job with the Lynn students, right? So it's really many times our young people that get caught in the middle, right, regarding all this nonsense that's happening. You guys might have heard, uh, maybe not this story, but there was a similar story uh, coming out of um, Milton, Massachusetts, but this one coming out of Canada. A biological male who says he's a woman has filed a human rights complaint against the hair removal spa in Ontario. 
The male claims he was discriminated against after he couldn't get a hair removal treatment because the Muslim woman has a religious reason to decline. Now, I think if you were that Muslim woman, you'd feel the same way, mm -hmm. right? If you were at a spa and a man comes in and says, I identify as a woman, I want to have female treatment and certain hair is removed, right? That that might be a little uncomfortable, okay? I mean, can you believe we're even having this conversation, right? So, uh, Milton, Massachusetts, same thing. We had a spa owner in Milton, Massachusetts. This is why we were concerned about the bathroom law, okay? Spa owner. Spa owner uh, gets sued, okay, spa in Massachusetts, in Mill Mill Massachusetts, gets sued by a man that comes into the spa and wants to have this kind of treatment done, right? And we would say, look, they need to be protected. That lady should never be sued for having to give that kind of service, right, um, in, in her spa, okay? So, you know, these are some, look, and, and, and I don't know, some people might look at these and say these are extreme um, scenarios, Okay? But they're happening. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That 10-year-old girl at the Woburn uh, Target, that happened where the man comes into her uh, woman's uh, bathroom, knocks on her door, entices her with candy as she's in her uh, bathroom stall. He takes off his shirt, right? Uh, like I said, police find him on the security cameras, but they can't do anything about it because he identified as a woman at the time, it's right? Good. And then the law says that, that it is a sincerely held belief system. That's how your law defines gender identity. So is our gender really a sincerely held belief? Okay. And look, people can identify however they want to in, in, in Massachusetts, in America. Okay. <coughs> but are these the laws that we, that we want to live under? Because there's a difference, right? There's a difference in terms of making it law and living a certain way in your personal life. Right? Because now that 10 year old girl is exposed and you can understand how frightened she is when that person comes into the bathroom, knocks on the door, and thankfully she was able to escape. But if you were that 10 year old girl, you'd be concerned as well. We had a, uh, in Milton, again, another story came out of Milton at the Fontbonne uh, School. This is an all girls Catholic school. Um, and so you had a homosexual man sue the school because they would not hire him to be their chef. Uh, I think this was in 2015. And again, you look at Gordon and you say, okay, well, Gordon never went to court and they basically won their case, okay? Well, Fontbonne didn't win their case, okay? They got sued and this guy won because they found that Fontbonne wasn't totally consistent in its uh, religious practices and how it did that. So because they weren't fully consistent, uh, they lost their case. And I want to read just a, a short bit uh, from that ruling from the judge. And this is in our Engage the Bay State um, curriculum for churches. You can take one home with you tonight. They're back at the table. But listen to this. According to Judge Wilkins, another reason that Fontbonne did not qualify for the exemption is that it encourages debate including on issues of same-sex marriage and does not prohibit students from exploring and even advocating ideas and positions contrary to church teachings. Thus, according to Judge Wilkins, religious schools that wish to qualify for the statute's explicit religious exemption must not only close themselves to non-believers, they must also actively squelch academic inquiry and prohibit diversity of thought. It is hard to believe that the authors of the Massachusetts statute envisioned this result. So really what this law does is it really just makes us go to our own corners, yeah. right? And is that really what the law intended? Um, so just something to think about in terms of the unintended consequences of these laws. And then here he just goes over what I, what I basically just said. Um, there is a church in, you guys know where Medford, Massachusetts is, right? Yeah. Okay, so they're using a public school facility for their church services. Now it's about a 500 member church. Uh, but at the time, they were being told that they could not use the, the uh, school building uh, for their church service. And so here is the uh, guidelines used, okay, so this is in Somerville. Somerville Public School Buildings. Uh, and you see in the bold at the bottom, it says use of school property to conduct religious services is not permitted use, right? So how many of us know of a church that at some point met in a middle school building or in a high school building or you know, some public school, right? Uh, that, that is discrimination to not be able to use that building. So I think it was actually Alliance Defending Freedom that you know, found this small print and basically told Somerville, 
you can't do this. That's, that, that is against the constitutional right of that particular church. And uh, they knew they were wrong, and so the church is currently there meeting, and the church is growing, right? But it's just a matter of don't be intimidated, and you know, reach out to MFI, reach out to Alliance Defending Freedom, because we want to be there to protect your religious liberty. Uh, this is a bill, Senate bill, that uh, we're going to be bringing up at Lobby Day, and this is a bill that concerns, you know, uh, Dr. Jaley's school. Uh, it, it, it concerns the Trinity Christian School I was just at this afternoon. Um, it's an act relative to preventing discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity by educational institutions appears to be targeting schools that would have biblical-based policies related to human sexuality and sexual behavior. Um, so again, uh, you know, getting at uh, who you allow in terms of students, right, to come into your school for admission, right? Um, and just because you're a Christian school and just because you have been consistent, is that really enough of a litmus test to say that, you know, and they would call it discrimination, but we would just say, look, Gordon says you need to abstain from sex outside of marriage if you're going to be hired as faculty, right? Christian schools should, should have the same freedom to say, this is the culture, these, these are the principles that we teach at our school, and if you want to come in and, and come under those, great, but if you're not going to do that, you can choose the school next door. And we should continue to have that kind of freedom, but this Senate bill wants to impose the state's will on every Christian school in Massachusetts. This was uh, just a picture that's Andrew Beck. You might have seen him on TV, uh, and he was going up against Representative Day. Uh, so Representative Day wanted to pass an anti-religious liberty law that basically would have reversed Hobby Lobby, right? Uh, if you guys are familiar with that case, this idea that once you become a business in Massachusetts, you leave your religious liberties at the doorstep. Um, and so, you know, Andrew's done a lot of uh, debate. You might have seen him on NECN or, or different things or heard him on different podcasts or something, but he just, you know, he does a wonderful job in the public square standing up for religious liberty, and in this case, Representatives Day never saw the day of light, and the pun is intended. So protect your ministry from sexual orientation lawsuits and, and other concerning things that are coming up today. Protecting your ministry is put out by Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, you know, Massachusetts Family Institute wants to be kind of your first level of defense, um, so please reach out to us if you're discriminated in any way, and then if we need to get Alliance Defending Freedom involved, we definitely will. How many of you think it'd be a great idea to have a Bible club in every school uh, in Massachusetts, right? So I want to tell you some, some encouraging stories. Uh, the city of Lynn, you guys know where Lynn is, just north of Boston, okay? Uh, we're working with a young girl, she's a senior named Rosa, and she uh, started a Bible club at the Lynn Vocational High School. And uh, she has a wonderful sponsoring teacher from <coughs> Venezuela, of all places, that knows discrimination, uh, Ms. Suarez. Ms. Suarez has been fantastic to work with. So has Rosa. Rosa uh, put up posters around the school, and uh, she did something super controversial on her posters. Could you imagine she had a Bible verse for her Bible club? Could you imagine? So the school told Rosa to tear down her posters. So Rosa, not really knowing her constitutional rights, feeling intimidated, tore down her posters. But she got in touch with us. And we put together a letter based on Rosa's constitutional rights, and a lot of those are expressed in this right to speak. You guys should all take one of these home with you tonight if you know students that want to start a club and they need to understand their constitutional rights. Uh, we, we sent this kind letter to the principal and uh, just explaining your constitutional rights. And wouldn't you know it that the very next day, the principal told Rosa to put her posters back on the wall. Yay. Right? Yeah. That's worth, that's worth saying yay about, right? Um, and so good for Rosa and her, her, her club continues to this day. Lincoln Sunbury, you guys know Lincoln Sunbury right outside of Massachusetts, right? We had, uh, we're working with a young uh, lady named Chloe. Chloe had 50 to 60 people sign up for her Bible club. That's a good number, 50 to 60 people. She was the largest sign up of any club at the school, okay, in Lincoln Sunbury. 
principal gets a little uncomfortable, comes up to Chloe and says, Chloe, can I please see your curriculum? Well, what do you think her curriculum is? The Bible. Right? <laughs> so uh, we send the principal the same kind letter, right? Saying these are, Chloe, these are Chloe's constitutional rights. And uh, he allows the club, right, to uh, exist. And one should know it, they're, they're partnering with Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Uh, and just the other week, a Patriots player shows up at Bible study to talk about his testimony. Uh, and just what a, what a fantastic experience for the kids that never would have happened unless Chloe took that brave step to tell her principal, hey, these are my constitutional rights, and we're going to start this Bible club at Lincoln Sunbury. Yeah, good for her. And then Barnstable High School. You guys know Barnstable High School. We're right in the thick of it, right? Um, Barnstable High School has about 2,000 students, right? We're working with a young man named Andrew. Uh, Andrew was told by the school he needed 20 signatures to uh, get his Bible club started. Now, we talked to ADF, and ADF actually said that it's unconstitutional to require signatures for a club. But we're like, you know what? We're just going to call all of our friends on the Cape and we're going to encourage them to get in touch with Andrew and get in touch with his school sponsor and get him those signatures. So Andrew called me about a week later and he said, Mr. King, I'm so excited about starting my club. People are coming out of the woodwork and uh, I shouldn't have a problem getting my signatures and I'm excited to get my club started. And he is also partnering with um, Feder uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes as well. So we have this really wonderful team of MFI who's going to protect your religious liberty, FCA who's going to keep the longevity of your club going through curriculum and inviting in great uh, celebrity athletes to come talk at your club. Uh, and we want to continue that momentum. So if you know students that want to start a club at their local high school uh, or middle school, please let us know. We want them to know that they are supported. And then I just got a, uh, a text the other day from a student in Watertown High School, and he wants to start a Bible club as well. So let's keep the momentum going. Are you encouraged by that? Yes. yes. Good. You know, they say, Paul says in 1 Timothy that it's our young people, right? Uh, don't let people look down on you because you are young, but set an example in character and in purity, right? That our, that our young people should be, should be, the expectations should rise for our young people, right? And I know that each one of you are inspired by these, these stories, and they are of our young people doing amazing things. So real quick, uh, the counseling ban. So this is, again, a concern to religious liberty. So if you guys know a therapist, okay, and this is another takeaway for tonight that I love, love, love. If you know a therapist that's willing to work with us on this, uh, there's a hearing at the State House this Tuesday. We absolutely need their voice down at the State House to protect the speech therapy rights of therapists. So basically what the counseling ban does is it says that if you are a therapist and you enter into what's called conversion therapy regarding gender identity or anything really on the LGBTQ spectrum, if you enter into conversion therapy, so you try to convert someone away from that spectrum, you are committing child abuse, okay? Because the theory is that anyone on the spectrum was born perfect, okay? Now this doesn't mean we're against kids that identify on the spectrum, okay? We're just saying that maybe we need to rethink that every kid that's on the spectrum was just born perfect and they need to remain on the spectrum for the remainder of their life. Especially knowing that 75 to 95 percent of kids that identify as transgender actually come out of that lifestyle. They actually start feeling comfortable in their anatomical skin. I said 75 to 95 percent by the time they turn 19. Counseling man would say you can't have that therapy, even though you might even want it. If you're a minor under the age of 17, the law says you're committing child abuse against your own body because you don't even know that you were born perfect. Think about that. Okay? That is really an attack on the liberty of our young people and also of therapists. And a lot of therapists are intimidated. So you know what I hear is therapists say, you know what, I'm not even going to enter into that therapy because I don't even want to come close to being prosecuted as a child abuser. Right? So last year this was defeated and in many ways because of the local church. We had over 500 people call the House of uh, Representatives, the Speaker of the House's office. They had to create a separate phone line because he was getting so many phone calls. Right? We want to do the same thing, if not more, uh, this year. So please, if you know a therapist, Tuesday is the day that they're having a hearing at 11.30 in the morning. It is essential. If that therapist has an appointment, tell them to postpone it and come down to the uh, state house. We absolutely need their testimony. 
This guy's name is Sam Brinton. He's the son of a Baptist preacher. He's going all over the United States trying to get the counseling ban passed in all 50 states. Would it surprise you that he's been successful in 10 out of 50 states? Two of those states are New Hampshire and Rhode Island. So the question I have is, and again, I'm not against Sam Brinton, okay? I'm not, I'm not a bigot, I'm not a hate. Ask my wife, ask my oldest son, okay? I'm a pretty nice guy, okay? But should Sam Brinton have more influence on this issue or should the church have more influence on this issue? Can I remind you that there's almost 8,000 churches in Massachusetts? And I mentioned about the law. I'm just going to kind of skip ahead to the second part. So what is gender identity according to the Massachusetts law? It may be shown by medical history, care, treatment, consistent and uniform assertion, or any other evidence that the gender-related identity is sincerely held as part of a person's core identity. How ambiguous and sincerely held as a person's core identity, right? Now this is the law, okay? So I'm trying to make this distinction in your personal life if you want to have this, this definition. Okay, you, that's your personal life. That's your own decision. Okay? But when it comes to the thing, the law that we all live under, is should this be the law in Massachusetts? So I mentioned these stories before. Daniel 3.16-18, through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story, right? Going before the, uh, the idol and told to bow down and would not bow down. Because we live under a higher law. Daniel 6.10, Daniel again, told not to pray, but he's under a higher law, and he knows he needs to pray. And then the story of the disciples, told not to preach in the name of Jesus, but you see at the end there in the bold, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And we cannot be consumed by the fear of man in our lives and have that trump the fear of God. Because where do we know wisdom comes from? From the Proverbs. It comes from the fear of God. And if we have too much fear of men, we might not be so wise. Amen? Amen. Amen. So there it is. The crux. And I'll end here. Martin Luther King Jr. on the church. Um, you know, I started by saying all these examples of, of speaking at churches all over Massachusetts, I've been so encouraged, right? And I think Martin Luther King Jr. hits it on the head. He says, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. The church is not a social club. Amen? Amen? The church is the conscience of the state. And when we remove ourselves from that duty, and it's not a calling, right? Duty. When we remove ourselves from that duty, then you can see everything that comes in to redefine marriage, to redefine gender, right? And to really cause chaos in our culture. So please consider coming to Lobby Day. Please pick up a, uh, a copy of Engage the Bay State. Uh, this goes into much greater detail of what I talked about tonight. Take a free to speak brochure, right, to any student that wants to start a Bible club, okay? And let's partner together to strengthen and protect the family in Massachusetts. Thank you so much. And then also, Diane has a super important bill that is uh, well sponsored to protect parental rights, especially when it comes to. Um, schools that have counselors coming in many times unbeknownst to parents uh, to to counsel them in the direction that maybe they don't want their kids to go in okay so please consider signing on to her bill as well thanks thank you so much yeah. okay we're going to have some time for questions so if anybody has a question, either for Paul J. Lee or Michael King, yes, I'll bring it. Michael, I'll bring it. You mentioned, you mentioned two girls that uh, you were uh, writing letters to the principal. Rosa was one of them. Yeah. I'm saying, well, what is in those letters? Mm -hmm. Basically just explaining their constitutional rights to uh, 
have a Bible club in school. Um, Focus on the Family has a day called Bring Your Bible to School Day. It's the first Thursday of every, of every October. Uh, you can bring your Bible to school every day. Um, you know, I always uh, remind people that, what was it? Uh, Dr. Jaley knows this better than I do, but I think it was over half of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had seminary degrees, right? I mean, we have a, a wonderful, even though we took prayer out of schools and all this stuff, people think all of a sudden we've removed the Bible entirely, but it's just not the case. Uh, so basically that letter was just a reminder of, of her constitutional rights. And if you get one of those pamphlets, The Right to Speak, you'll see more about what was in that letter. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, the time of Lobby Day, what time? Good, good question. Um, so Lobby Day, Wednesday, March 20th, starting at 10 a.m. at Park Street Church. You guys know where Park Street Church is? Right in Boston, right at Boston Common. Uh, there's a bus. The closest bus to here is in Brockton, leaving from North Baptist Church. Uh, you can, te do you guys text? Does everyone here text? If you don't, you can get my business card and email me, okay? But just text the word lobby to the number 797979, okay? Actually, I'm going to put that up on the screen because I do have a flyer, a flyer for that. But please consider doing that to uh, come to Lobby Day because that is so important. There you go. And there's flyers for Lobby Day in the back, so, so please, please take those flyers with you. Are there any other questions? Oh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, this question is for Pastor Jay Lee. Um, a lot of kids are coming up and they don't know that the Ten Commandments were removed from the schools and there was a very distinct um, decision by the Supreme Court that did it saying something to the effect that if children read it, they might believe it, if they believed it, they might act on those commandments. Could you give us some more information about that? Yeah, that was in the Midwest and the, uh, the concept of the Ten Commandments. You see, the Ten Commandments were the embedded foundation of our society and for decades. And so putting the Ten Commandments up in a school was never considered to be controversial until recently. And we're saying recently now, 20 years, 25 years, this was not a recent case. This was a, um, a case where they, the way that the court reasoned that situation was the fact that um, they were trying to come to the fact that the idea is rooted in the misunderstanding of the First Amendment. First Amendment did not create a wall of separation between church and state. It created a wall of separation between state and national government. Mm -hmm. There was a wall of separation, and basically the, the states could be as religious as they wanted to be. In the national government, you could not, you could not do that. So in other words, there were 11 of the 13 original colonies you had to ascribe to be a Christian to even run for civil office. So at this local state level, um, this was uh, always our heritage. So the idea that in a state, in a local school, Ten Commandments go up, it was crazy, but what they had to do is they had to reason that if there's any religious influence at all within a public building or sector, the idea is that has to be removed. Of course, you recognize this is spiritual blindness because all other kinds of religions have those kinds of influences. And so the idea came and the reasoning came that if the Ten Commandments were on the wall, it would be a problem because students might read them. Secondarily, if they read them, they might be influenced by them. And if they were influenced by them, the religion of Christianity or Judaism in that case would, would have an uh, influence on them. So I think it's rooted, though, in the misunderstanding of the, quote, separation of church and state and the roots of the First Amendment. Keep in mind that when the First Amendment was ratified in the 1790s and brought forward, uh, it was ratified by the Congress of the United States and was ratified by many of the state leaders who were very religious. They were not trying to get Christianity out of public life. They were trying to say, we don't want a national government that will tell Vermont how Christian it ought to be, or Massachusetts, mm. or any other. It should be determined by the bottom up from local and state governments. Mm. Thank you. Do you have another one? Yeah. <laughs> um, recently, there was a bill entered by a representative from Worcester. I think it was called the Roe Amendment, mm. which is going to extend abortion in Massachusetts yeah. to a new level. 
some of the other states that are considering this legislation are talking about making abortion a fundamental right. Now, this is language that was used back with Roe versus Wade in 1972, and I believe that right was reduced with the Casey decision against Planned Parenthood in 1992. Would you please explain the difference between a fundamental right and how we would see that in the public square and in public facilities? And is it coming to us in Massachusetts, or what should we be yeah. looking out for? Great question. So, um, so you guys all know what happened in Virginia, right, with the pediatrician governor, right, that said we'll make the baby comfortable, that goes through an abortion and um, is still alive, born alive, right? So now we're not only concerned about the unborn, we're concerned about the born, right? And I'm sure you know what happened in New York State, right? Just such evil. I mean, let's call it what it is. It's evil, right? Um, the, what you're referring to, ma'am, is called the Roe Access Act, okay? This is a bill being introduced in Massachusetts currently, and another reason, if not maybe the most important reason, to come to Lobby Day. We absolutely need your voice. The, the born need your voice, okay? And I'm just I'm gonna read for, for you a clause from the bill. A physician acting within their lawful scope of practice may perform an abortion when according to the physician's best medical judgment, and I want you to hear how ambiguous this can be, okay? Best medical judgment, okay? Based on the facts of the patient's case, the patient is beyond, beyond 24 weeks, okay, so the law currently is 24 weeks, okay, this is beyond 24 weeks. Is a baby viable after 24 weeks, or even before 24 weeks, right? I mean, we go all the way back to conception, right? Because it's gonna become a, it's a person, it's gonna become a person, right? Uh, beyond the 24 weeks from the, from the commencement of pregnancy, and the abortion is, now I want you to hear how ambiguous this is, is necessary to protect the patient's life or physical or mental health, okay? So I'm not meaning to lessen, you know, what ladies in crisis are going through, okay? It's very difficult, okay? But just listen to how ambiguous this is, right? And this is beyond 24 weeks. Or in cases of lethal fetal anomalies, or where the fetus is incompatible with sustained life outside the uterus. Medical judgment may be exercised in the light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, I mean, what does familial mean in this context, right? Uh, and the person's age, relevant to the well-being of the patient, okay? So you can see how concerning the Roe Access Act is that would just increase access to abortion. So really, it just makes late-term abortion legal in Massachusetts. And is that what you want? It's a bill right now. We don't want it to become law. Right? So please, I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you, come to Lobby Day and make sure you're, there, nothing, nothing compares to you meeting face to face with your legislator, okay? A call is great, an email is okay, okay? But a face to face conversation is very important, okay? And your voice matters. 20 doctors defeated physician assisted suicide. Right? 300 people were considered the second largest in a two-year legislative session. A thousand of our Chinese friends were considered the largest in 70 years. Please come to Lobby Day and stand up for the life of the board. Let me just say one thing. Um, my wife and I got a chance just recently, uh, Charlene's here, uh, we were able to have a private screening of the movie on plan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, coming out at the end of March. I think it's March 29. I think it's toward the end of it. And how many, how many know the pillow guy? When I say the pillow guy, everybody knows it, right? Well, um, Mike Lindell is uh, uh, really promoting and underwriting a lot of this. Mm. And the um, amazing thing about the movie, of course, it, it tells the true story of Abby Johnson, mm. who you may have heard uh, being interviewed in many cases, who was the director of Planned Parenthood for eight years. Mm -hmm. And so she was on that side, and then ended up witnessing an abortion by ultrasound, and completely changed her mind. Mm. And I think one of the key things that we can do is Definitely, uh, you go to go to Lobby Day, uh, be able to deal with it. Because what has happened is over the years, when, when Roe vs. Wade was first um, uh, adjudicated in 1973, and the decision came out, it was touted as the fact that yes, but it was only it's only going to be rare, and we want fewer and fewer abortions. Mm -hmm. 
and the ideas of this, what has happened, and now you see, of course, since the election in 2018, this rush to take this window mm -hmm. to make abortion a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, a fundamental right in law is the same as a privilege. See, unalienable rights are critical rights that a government has, because a government can't give you them. Mm -hmm. A fundamental right is often a government-granted right. Mm -hmm. And what the government gives, the government can take away. Mm -hmm. The critical thing is, when this is the case, this means we are moving toward the fact of just about everything being accepted. Mm -hmm. And come on, look at how bizarre things are saying. I, I can't even believe that some things are being said by elected representatives. Mm -hmm. and, and you just look at this and you say, this couldn't be more bizarre. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, I think it provides us a great opportunity. Because before we had to try to convince people that right. this is evil. That's right. Now, even, the, even some of the staunchest people that consider themselves liberal, I was speaking with a liberal uh, recently, and we get along fine. I said, I said, it's good. We may differ on what we're liberating mm -hmm. and what we're conserving. But at the same time, even individuals that I never thought would be that way are, are absolutely horrified mm -hmm. by what is happening. Right. And so it provides us also an opportunity. So I also would bring that out because mm -hmm. A movie like that, that first weekend it comes out, mm -hmm. is going to be huge. Yeah. And it's going to, I would say, my wife said, it's not an easy movie. Yeah. What would you say? Hard hitting? It's hard. it's hard, but it tells the truth. And I, I would also say, too, um, the uh, Kermit Gosnell, well, Gosnell, I don't know yes. if you guys saw Gosnell, <laughs> uh, but when that came out, we encouraged people, if you can't make it to the theater, pay for a ticket. Like, just use your money to. Um, encourage that theater to keep playing that. So just to put that out there, that if you can't go see Unplanned, which we hope you can, at least purchase a ticket, right? right. Um, very yeah, effective. But also, I think a lot of times in Massachusetts, oh, the sir, wait, no, let me just get in the theater. So just to that, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Also in Massachusetts, a lot of the movies, the conservative movies, are not <coughs> in our theaters. Mm -hmm. And we've called this, and they say, well, it's not worth our, our time to have those. but. If you can call your local theater and say, when is Unplanned coming? We have a lot of people that want to go. Or, you know, mm -hmm. just really plug it. I think yeah. it's important. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Ellen, do you have another? We have a couple of uh, professional sign holders. Are they allowed to bring signs into the lobby then? Yeah. <laughs> no, that'd be great. <laughs> I guess it depends what your sign says. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. I've never heard of a professional sign hole. That's that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an experience. <laughs> it's awesome. He's experienced. Uh, so a few years ago, um, the Justina Palatier situation um, happened here in Massachusetts. And, uh, I know uh, the uh, legislative sessions before this one. There's always been a Justina's law that always gets um, that fails to pass. Um, that uh, would allow parents, if they had different options in medical treatment, the parent to choose uh, which one they wanted for their child. Um, and in, in their case, they chose uh, a, a um, New England Medical Center's plan, and the Children's Hospital then kidnapped their daughter, did their treatment plan, everything went downhill for her. I'm just wondering if you know if that bill has been proposed again this time around, mm. and um, if it's if this is still an issue because they've failed to pass it, how might it affect you know parents <coughs> with uh, kids who have uh, gender confusion? Right. Um, if, if one doctor says they need puberty blockers and hormone therapy, and another doctor says they don't, and they go with the doctor that says they don't. That's right. I'm not, I'm not sure whether that. So I'm with you. I'm not. I'm not sure if it's being proposed, but there are six thousand bills that get proposed every two years. Uh, so we try to comb through as many of them as we can. But what what I will say to that is, MFI just did a podcast on this, and um, I think the title was "Don't Let DCF Take Your Son and Make Him Someone Else's Daughter," right? Um, and it may sound absurd, and it is absurd. Um, but this is what's happening. We just had a mom come into our office and this was the exact situation. You know, mom and dad are getting a divorce. Dad wants daughter, 17 year old daughter to have puberty blockers. Mom doesn't, right? And so who's the state gonna, when the state gets involved, 
uh, who's the state going to want to have custody? I mean, you would hope in this case it'd be the mom, but actually she's struggling to get custody from the dad that wants to allow the puberty blockers, right? Mm -hmm. And just think about this. Puberty blockers, we know that many times testosterone can make a young girl sterile, right? So just think about this for a second, right? 12-year-old girl, so let's say she's a tomboy, right? And she does boy things, right? And now you get these school curriculums that say you can identify five different spectrums, right? And if you go on Facebook, there's over 50 different genders that you can choose from. So now you're on five different spectrums, and you, and you split those spectrums into 50 different parts. So let's say you're a tomboy, and you're like, well, I'm not fully feminine, right? Maybe I'm five fiftieths masculine. And now you start to question, right? And now you question so much that you go to your doctor and you say, can you prescribe me puberty blockers? You sterilize your body. Now, as I said, 75 to 95% of the time when you turn 19, you become comfortable in your anatomical skin. Well, you weren't able to get the therapy you needed as a minor under the counseling ban, right? So by the time you turn 19, you're like, oh, I was a tomboy and you know, it's okay that I'm a girl, but I wanna have kids and I wanna have a family. Well, that's been stolen from you because somebody confused you, right? Knowing that 75 to 95% of the time you were going to feel comfortable by the time you turn 19. So what I ask is really, what is abuse? Is it abusive to confuse that child and, and not offer her the therapy that would help her understand her gender, right? Can you see how this can really kind of take a toll and be so incredibly abusive to our young girls? So thanks for bringing that up because this is definitely the parental rights whole frontier, another reason to get behind Diane's bill. Yes, and some of us knew back when the Justina Pelletier case went down and was in the news, some of us knew um, that was a precedent. We, we knew what, what the consequences of that would be. Mm. And I think that's the main reason why there was an ideological divide. There were plenty of people on the left who might have sympathized with Justina, mm. but they sympathized with the authority of the state to do what it wants right. just as much, right. whereas some of us thought of it as a threat. Right. Yeah. It's true. Anyone else? Um, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question, and I wish I had a good answer, you know. But I think we're in this ambiguous space. Um, you know, there's stories of, uh, you know, there was a, a young girl in the in the city or right outside of Fitchburg, right? The 17 year old girl, uh, she's in her locker room, her girls' locker room. Boy comes in, starts changing, right? She complains to the principal, and principal says to the 17 year old girl, "You go find a different place." to change and I think that's kind of where we're at right I mean that's why we were so concerned about question three and wish we could have just repealed this whole thing um, so yeah I mean there's really not that safety net you know for our young girls and boys that legitimately are gonna feel like their privacy is being uh, violated and it's a slippery slope to you know if you if you just think what you are right well that can change from day to day right so I mean let's just say there's a 15 year old boy that wants to go in the girls room right I mean who's to say that he believes that or not and who's gonna make that judgment and can he go in there and just loiter and or can he go in there and just be there for five minutes and do his thing but you know who knows well, just to make this a uh, uh, quick comment that uh, you may be aware in the news and everything else that 
What have often happens when people don't think through consequences in dealing with these things? Have you been aware of the Martina Netrovalova uh, situation where here's a tennis star, identifies as a lesbian, uh, and, and goes through the situation, but recognizing the consequences mm -hmm. of this issue are such that they're finding more and more male athletes who will identify as women in order to win the fem feminine sports, right. in order to get the, the, uh, not only the trophies, but in order to get the uh, scholarships going to college. Mm -hmm. And so um, the critical thing is because they can identify as long as they play the sport, then as soon as they're done with that sport, they can identify back again. Right. Uh, and so you can go back and forth and individuals, and these are leading lesbians and homosexuals today that are speaking out against this, <laughs> saying this is not right, we've got to draw a line somewhere, and they're being thrown out. Right, they have an for them. So the point is, you, have, you and I have to recognize that we are in a situation where um, a lot of these things are emotional, they're reactionary, and therefore when a principal has dealt with this, the, the uh, law in Massachusetts uh, at its foundation gave tremendous amount of latitude to superintendents in schools. And a lot of times superintendents make these decisions very quickly based on the emergency in front of them. Mm -hmm. And then it ends up at the school board, but school boards have been restripped of most of their powers mm -hmm. to the place where they no longer deal with curriculum, <coughs> no longer often even deal with some of these kinds of policies. Now, I think school committees should be able to you know, discuss these things, but all I'm saying is what happens is when these things go down a path, mm -hmm. that there's a certain hidden premise that if we can learn to get to the premise of it, we can predict where this is going to go. Right. And it's going to come into conflict. One thing I tell my students all, all the time, and that's simply this, you can be sure that every humanistic premise will end up defeating itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Because it's illogical. Right. And it will not end up bringing the fruit of what it promises. Let me just make one quick comment on the school policy. So uh, many of your school systems, unbeknownst maybe to you, maybe beknownst to you, are passing school policies that basically say that if your kid is transitioning at school, okay, let's say with gender, but you are considered subjectively by the school staff a highly rejecting parent. Have you heard this term? Okay, highly rejecting parent. Okay, so if you're considered a highly rejecting parent, the school by the policy is given the power to make a subjective decision and not, number one, not tell the parent, right? Number two, and this is, gets to Diane's bill, yes. bring in counselors yeah. to counsel your child into that lifestyle. So your tax dollars are going to convert your child into something that you're very concerned about, right? So we have to know what's going on in our school committees. Um, we were in Westford, Massachusetts, dealing with this issue. And uh, we had the majority of people in the room disagreed with the school policy. And at the end of the night, the, the, one of the ladies, in a very, I, I consider, pompous way, uh, told us, you're just not educating your children enough. And they need to understand, you know, you, for some reason, you haven't done a good job parenting your child, because they would understand the school policy if you would just educate them, right? So, you know, run for school committee, right? Uh, I mean, get involved in your community. Uh, you know, in these important ways. Thank you. I had a, a question too about the bathroom bill. Mm -hmm. Is it true that if you complain about somebody being in the locker room, you, you don't think it should be there, that you could be fined for the complaint? Yeah, so it's, it's however we dis define discrimination, right? Um, so, uh, again, there's, there's a level of, of ambiguity, but the point is, yes, if you're found discriminating, right, uh, you could be fined up to fifty thousand dollars or sent to jail for up to a year. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Every time these topics come up, particularly when we get to the point where they say, "Let's go run for school committee," mm -hmm. I have to feel like I'm king of the elder. Mm -hmm. Schools are lost. Mm -hmm. Public schools are lost. You want to fight a losing battle? Fine, but you are going to lose it. The only thing that will save future generations is to get them out of the public schools. You notice the school committees started to react to these things, so they took the power away from the school committees. Yeah. If you replace the school superintendents, the schools are run, and the school superintendents will not have any authority anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, There was a reason why the whole education establishment was called a blob. There is no saving it. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that might change it is if they lost like 25% of their 
population, then they might respond, get out of public schools. Mm -hmm. If you want to consider that, there's an, uh, uh, some magazine articles I brought here called Rescuing Our Children, mm -hmm. and they, they give the update on the condition of education in our country and also the options, homeschooling, Christian schools. This whole transgender thing, I hope that's the star that breaks the camel's back mm. as far as the public schools are mm. concerned. The entire psychological social services system meets the family at the school. That's right. You take the children out of the school, and you can insulate them from the uh, anti-Christian bureaucracy. But as long as they are in the schools, they you have them. They have them, not you. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Thank you. I'd like to go back to this lady's question over here about whose authority is it, mm -hmm. the principal. Former school board member, I know that mm. still school board members write policy. Mm -hmm. And so, it's really up to the school board member, mm. I believe, and their elected officials. Mm. And so we have a duty, call them. Mm. Thank you, one, the school board. Yeah. I've been saying that. Yeah. Um, call your school board, find out who the school board members are, say, what is going on? Have you written a policy? Mm -hmm. Where do you stand with this? Where does the school stand with this? Keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. That's what we have to do. Yep. So I have a different take on the public schools. Mm -hmm. I say, work in the public school, teach in the public school, stand guard in the public school, pray, open your eyes, walk up and down the hallways, ask questions, push back, and I, well, well, I've been teaching in the public school for 23 years, and it's not easy. Mm. And there's a tide of, mm. of liberalism against me at any given day. And any given day, somebody's going to ask me, would you please put that triangular sticker on your door? Mm. And I say, no, I will not put that triangular sticker on my door. Mm. Why not? Because every child is safe in my room, mm. and I don't prefer one type of child over another. Mm -hmm. Every single child is safe in my life. Okay. So yes, yeah, so my take is completely opposite. Mm -hmm. I just wish we had more people, right. more watch guards. And, and by the way, the Christian school is not the answer, not Pastor Jaley's school. His school is wonderful. We went to a Christian school graduation seminary where they did not even stand up and pledge allegiance to the flag. They bashed President Trump, mm. and they had uh, they were advocating and lauding. Um, what was it? Wow. Not only that, uh, wow. some kind of sexuality stuff. Wow. Oh, I readily admit that just because they call themselves private or even Christian doesn't mean to be adequate. I mean, it's, as far as I can tell, the parochial schools are lost. But that's because they're they absorbed into lost. Uh, I, I very much appreciate what you're saying um, in both of you, I think, coming from a good place, right? Um, I'll give you a little perspective on the homeschool thing. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but um, so there's six million private school students in uh, the America. You know how many homeschoolers, at least from what I understand? There's three million, right? So, um, and, and I'm not advocating just for homeschooling. I, That's I, just the registered ones. That's right. <laughs> West of the Mississippi, there's five. My, my kids are not in that number. No. Um, so, but I appreciate what you're both saying, right? I mean, I think if you can be a, a, a Christian, like look at, look at the kids I was talking about in the Bible clubs, right? We wouldn't have these Bible clubs if it weren't for these brave students uh, in these schools and how inspiring those stories are, right? Uh, but I agree with you too. I mean, uh, our kids, if you do the math, are in school, what? Um, what is it, eight times however many days, I mean, it gets into that like 1,500 hours a year, and if they're in a sport, like it's even more, and then it's like they go to youth group maybe one hour a week, maybe they're in church one hour a week, so we're talking 104 hours compared to 1,500 hours, so we just have to be realistic about the exposure that our kids are getting, and if they're getting all that exposure, right, we just, as parents, right, we just have to be realistic and say, okay, how are we gonna combat this exposure? And just, just keep in mind, as educational trends, to recognize that right now, the uh, Christian school movement is on a decline, a very significant decline, especially in New England. And the homeschool movement is on an incline. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it nationally, even though the Christian school is on a decline, homeschool is on an incline, it's basically fish going from one bowl to the other. Mm -hmm. So still, after all these years, 86% of all the children in America are in public school. 
Hmm. So if you combine all the Christian school students, all the homeschool students, you're only dealing with 14%. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with a tremendous minority, and therefore there has to be a missionary movement as well. And so mm -hmm. you have to realize uh, what, that, what that is and realize the demographics uh, that we're dealing with because Christian schools are, uh, used to be opening every 24 hours back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Now one Christian school is closing every 24 hours. Wow. So you have to realize that um, the Christian school movement, and most of that is twofold, 50% due to homeschoolers who are pulling them out of the private schools mm. and the other 50 percent they're going back to the public schools because they want to play sports so it's a it's a, a a double and part of that is because of the onslaught um, that people said look if i'm paying tax dollars my child should be able to be on the sports team and often because the homeschooling child has more time and those who are coming out the sports teams they want them because bottom line they want to win games and so this has been a but you have to realize what the changing of the demographics is that's all Good point. So realize what you're yeah. Good point. Is there anyone else? I just wanted to let you know if you do homeschool and your kids have a right to be on the school teams. I yes. Found that's correct. School, I had homeschoolers on my team and they were correct. Off of yeah. That's yeah. right. That's a good point. I have a quick boring legal question. So you've got R O E, that's S D 109, is that right? I think. For the uh, Row Access Act? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so you just informed me there's uh, SD2200, and you're telling me that that's the same thing, only worse. Could you just bring us up to speed? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, an act to remove obstacles and expand abortion access, SD, so Senate docket number 109. Yeah. Okay. 2200? Zero, zero. What, what's the difference? I think the difference is that we're paying for the second one, right? I'm not understanding. I'm not sure. no, yeah, if it's I, I'm only looking at this one because I, I I think there's only a Senate docket for this. I think that's correct. And I don't think there's a House bill, so I think it's just I think it's just Senate docket. Was it 109? Yeah, 109. Yeah. What's what's the SD two two zero zero then? Was that the Senate bill I was talking about earlier with the uh, uh, discriminating against Christian schools? Is that no. what you're referring to? No, it's an abortion bill. Um, okay. I just read through it, but it's long. Okay. And this was your fellow Chris J. J. Yeah. And he wrote me about that and said this one is worse than SD 109, but it's I don't understand. Yeah, I think well. So Chris has been going. He's our lobbyist. He's been kind of going through all that stuff. So um, the one that. I'm aware of at least tonight is the 109, and then I'm sure we can talk about more on, on lobby day. But the but the point is that we have these concerning late-term abortion bills that we don't want to pass. But thank you. That's great that you're going on the website and learning about that. That's awesome. Um, Paul Jelly, would you like to just um, talk about the revival, the Christian re revival, because you do have a service uh, coming up at your church this month? Sure. Well, you know, it's always good to end with good news. That's right. <laughs> so across America and also in New England, believe it or not, usually when uh, revivals are talking about and there are uh, tremendous amounts of them, New England is often left out. Uh, we still are the least churched area in mm -hmm. America. Um, the least churched area, about a study nine years ago was done, the fewest number of people that go to church in the country was Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. ranked number one to be the least religious a zone and area in America. Of course, close second behind that is Massachusetts and Vermont and, and most of the New England states. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things you have to recognize is that in spite of all that, there is a massive swell of revival taking place among youth mm -hmm. and adults. And it's taking place in New England as well. And there's, a, there's this swell of hap of, mm -hmm. that's happening. And one of the key characteristics about that is that more and more Christians are willing to come together to unite to regionally do this. Now I've been involved with several boards regionally around New England with pastors and this really started to crescendo around 2002, 2003, so it's been going on for a while. Hmm. But it's happening right now. You're probably familiar with Glory of God on Cape Cod. And that is a movement that is continuing to grow where churches actually cancel their midweeks, come together and do that. So on the South Shore now, that's happening from Hingham <laughs> down to Plymouth where uh, the fourth Sunday of the month, we're canceling our activities and all joining together. So uh, that's happening, and our church, New Testament Church, is hosting the next one at the end of March, March 24. And so this is happening more and more, where key points that we're talking about here are uniting people in prayer. Mm. 
and uniting people in a way to get the church together. One of the biggest problems we have, of course, with the church is we're not united. Mm -hmm. We're polarized, and we stay in our little corners, and then individuals get involved, but, but churches don't get involved. Mm -hmm. And it's especially, this is bringing pastors together. Mm -hmm. now, that's a heart I've had for years, to get pastors together, and to get pastors to recognize that they they have a responsibility and they are can be bold mm. in their pulpits. So so I'm praising God for that. So that that is happening and that's a good thing. Amen. Uh, the time is six o'clock, six to seven thirty. It's Sunday night, March twenty four, that we're hosting the next one at our church. There are about about twenty five churches and pastors that I've identified being in that movement. That doesn't mean they'll all show up at every event, but that's that's happening. So it's good. Do you want to say anything else? I think um, we're, we're coming close to 9 o'clock, and I just want to remind people that there's a lot of information on the back table, mm -hmm. the things that you can take home. Um, please stop there and, and uh, help yourself uh, learn more about Liberty Chalkboard. And um, I'll just give each one of our speakers a, a few minutes to close. But thank you all very much for coming tonight. And if, after we do close, if you want to just... Um, ask a question to one of our speakers afterwards. We have a few minutes to do that. Thank you. So just a reminder, if you know a therapist, um, <laughs> right, Tuesday um, at the State House, please, please, please rack your mind or whatever it is to, to, to let us know. Uh, we need them to come down to the State House and testify at 1130, 1130 this Tuesday, okay? So please let me know. And when is lobby meet. day? Uh, lobby day is Wednesday. Thank you, thank you, Pastor Jill. Uh, Wednesday, March twentieth. Okay. Wednesday, March twentieth, from ten a.m. to two p.m. Closest bus to here is Brockton. Okay. Um, and then one other thing, just as a word of encouragement, uh, is tomorrow morning I'll be at a nine o'clock breakfast in Brockton to celebrate the opening the of an ultrasound bus. Uh, and in proportion as the discipline of families, there, North Baptist Baptist Church, will the happy uh, organization of communities be affected and national culture and character become an vagrant, ultrasound turbulent, to see their baby right because we know statistically relevant. girls don't have abortions, at least more of them don't have abortions when they see their ultrasound. So we definitely praise the Lord for that. Uh, and there's just there's a lot of good stuff happening around the state in terms of, like I said, all these churches having us come speak. If we can come speak at your church, please invite us to come speak at your church. We'd love to do that. Thank and uh, just Google Unplanned and watch the trailer. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Linda, I'd like to do something with, that we didn't do in the beginning that we usually do. Can we stand up and salute?